welcome to episode 32 of the Food Grads Podcast, the podcast where we explore careers in the food, beverage, and hospitality industries. I'm your host, Veronica Hislop, a molecular science graduate student and career partner with Food Grads. This week on the podcast, I interviewed Nasir Hamid, Senior Corporate Director of Global Quality and Food Safety Systems at Acadian Sea Plants. Acadian Sea Plants is a family-owned business and is a fully integrated biotechnology manufacturer of premium agricultural products for animals and plants, cultivated sea vegetables, and functional ingredients derived from select species of marine plants. In this episode, Nasir and I talked about all things food safety and his long-standing career within it. Nasir has traveled all around the world, taking on positions from Pakistan, India, Dubai, Canada, and so many more. He talked to me about Acadian sea plants and the different ways that they are producing seaweed and where it's going. I learned more about the pet food industry and the considerations that also need to be taken in that aspect of food safety. It was really interesting learning about what it's like working in upper management positions within the food safety realm. Nasir explained to me how they stay on top of things and they bridge that gap that can happen between the ground level floor work that we see on the production floor and upper management and their corporate policies and food safety systems. Overall, if you are interested in a career in food safety, then you need to check out this episode. Nasir gave out some really good advice about what you should be doing at each stage of your career. And overall, the key is to stay curious no matter how far along you are. So enough with that introduction, let's get on with the show. Good morning. I most welcome Veronica, uh, especially being from the same profession, regardless of how long we have been in this field. I think it's still an honor for me to be able to speaking to you and to our fresh graduates and the people who they are into their few first years of their career. And if I can add any value to their, their career and their career path, I would be very glad and blessed to do that. I love that. The best part about having a podcast is how often do you get to be one-on-one with an individual that you've really never met before and get to dive into their their work and their life. So I think for our audience, we've kind of prefaced this by saying that you've had this long-standing career. We don't really know much about you right now. So I would love if you would be able to talk to us about what you do today and steps you took to get to this place. I was born in Pakistan. And I did my primary education there. And I did my basic university education there. I graduated from University of Agriculture, majoring food science and technology. It's an honor degree, which is equivalent to a master's degree there. I started, basically, my first career step was in Nestle in Pakistan as a research scholar, part of my university education and research. That really set up my mind to be thinking global and Nestle is a, is a worldwide company. So it, it just gave me a vision to not only just for Pakistan, but also for outside world. After my studies, I worked, I was very blessed that I started working for a huge multinational company in Pakistan, which was setting up their first concentrate orange juice concentrate business in Pakistan. So I started working with them as, uh, you know, in, in their application and also installation of the plant and then starting of the plant. And this company was Cargill, Cargill International, which is uh, Cargill Foods from USA. It's a $125 billion company. I worked for them a few years in Pakistan, and then I took a scholarship to come out for some post-graduation studies in University of Georgia in US. And from there on, Cargill offered me a position to work in US with them. So next uh, seven to eight years, I was in the United States, in Florida, basically at Cargill Juice Division Worldwide Headquarters. I started working as a technical resource and calibrated their quality systems and their operational excellence systems and their controls and process side in their eight different facilities in the world, in Chile, in China, Pakistan, in Europe, Holland, Rotterdam, Brazil, and also a few facilities in the U.S. and Canada side. So eight, almost eight years working with Cargill. I then moved with Cargill to, to Canada and worked in their joint venture with Vitality Brands, Vitality Beverages. I switched my path 
with a small stop at uh, D'Angelo Beverages for one year project. I then moved on to Parmalat, which is Nectalis Canada nowadays. I worked for their uh, dairy food division and uh, almost three years. From there, I got an opportunity to sit in an exam for a national level exam for CFIA, which is Canadian Food Inspection Agency. I started working as one of the national technical guys for their allergen program. And I think within first year of me joining the CFIA, I won another, I passed another exam and became the chief of national food safety risk profiling. Wow. CFIA. And worked for them uh, until 2009 with some personal choices. I was then offered a position with PepsiCo International in Asia Pacific to be the head of quality food safety, new product innovations and commercialization for entire Asia Pac, North Asia and South Asia both, based in Bangkok in Thailand. So from 2009 to 2012, I worked with PepsiCola, 22 countries and with about 140 different facilities that I was looking after with my small team in Thailand. Then I worked for a uh, UAE company, which is Arab Emirates company, Actia. It's a government-owned uh, company industry, and they have I think about seven to eight different type of food product lines. I did one year project with them in Abu Dhabi and set up their corporate quality systems. I was then offered a position uh, in national aquaculture group in Saudi Arabia in the same region as the first ever corporate director of their quality systems and food safety and applied R&D directorate and then moved on to be the chief quality and food safety officer for the same group. It was a collaborate of different companies which they were working in the seafood manufacturing, farming, onshore and offshore farming, huge system second in the world. So for the next five, five and a half years, six years, I worked for them. And uh, just then cutting it short, I then moved a, a decision with, with my family to move back to Canada, to our homeland. This is where my daughters went through their final years in the high school. And uh, they are now off to their universities, both my older daughters. So I joined uh, in August, 2018, I joined uh, my current company, Acadian Sea Plant Limited, the food feed and fertilizer using the aquaculture and marine resources. And I can then later on explain to that. So I became the global head of quality as the senior corporate director for quality, food safety, feed safety, plant health, and uh, their technical affairs. And this is where I am in uh, Halifax, Dartmouth, uh, Nova Scotia, and speaking to you this morning. I hope I tried to try to put together <laughs> my 26 years of career in, in maybe six minutes. Oh, well, you definitely did, at least in my eyes. Wow, that is so much that you've done. You're not even just limited to one country. You've, you've gone on a global scale. And to even take these jobs that are around the world, to me, you know, it's, honestly, it's a bit terrifying leaving Canada. What was your thought process in taking these new opportunities? Like, weren't you scared? <laughs> I, I wanted to know what you thought about that. I, th I think you have to have a nature. You have to have an attitude in you. Uh, when I was growing up, definitely being born in a, in a small area in Pakistan and then looking at the world from there, I decided myself to be not building walls around my, my personality and not keeping myself into silos, professionally and personally both. So that character basically opened me up to the whole world. And like I said, that I was lucky enough that I started my career with Nestle and companies like Cargill, which were worldwide visionary companies, and they, they grew you up with them all over the world. The other thing that I have, I have noticed that human beings all over the world have the same things and features. If you open up to them honestly and with respect and candor, and you love them as, as uh, one of your beings, then you will see that it will never be as scary to go to a new new area, new country, new culture, new language, new people. Uh, you will all relate. And I think that my 25, 26 years of career, if I have been to different parts of the world and worked with different 
teens and people and different people from different cultural background and educational background and professional backgrounds. That really grew me up and brought me to this level where today I can take any challenge in my field anywhere in the world and go and make it a success. And that what really builds you up uh, as a human being and as a professional. So no, I, I really don't feel that much of any concern to be in a new area or to be working with, with people from different area. Actually, my family has also been in this journey with me. I've been to about 39 countries of the world already and work in more than maybe 12 countries. And uh, my family has been to 19 countries of the world. Wow. So, so this is what made us a global family. So when people say world is a global village, uh, I think we have improved right here. Wow, that's amazing. There's two things that stood out to me. The first, I love the fact you had your family to go around with you with this journey because I, I could imagine for some people, they think if you really focus on your career, you you lose that family aspect because of course that's a big decision with whatever career you take once you get a little later in your life. But I also just want to point out I love how you said about like treating people with love and respect. It's it's a good reminder. Interesting how you've taken it and, and thought about how that can make another situation less scary going around the world because you, you already have that in your mind that that's going to take you to be comfortable with other people and to really make a new home wherever you go. No, this is, this is really true. And I also teach my daughters as well. The word will behave to you and people will behave to you the way you will perceive them and how you will conduct with them. So I think that for us, it has been a success story that uh, no matter where we've been in the world, you talk about Asia Pacific countries. I mean, I used to work in one night in, in Mongolia and going over a camp on the camel's back. <laughs> oh my gosh. And then after two days, I'll be sitting in Tokyo talking about a new, new packaging the rollout in, 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 in <laughs> part of Asia. So, I mean, you have to be very flexible. You mm -hmm. have to be, I would say, receptive of uh, different, different backgrounds. And at the same time, you should keep your student alive inside you. Because if you let that student die in you, then you will not learn and you will not appreciate what you have. Going around the world, being with the people and learning from them has been my asset. Wow, that's that's already great advice right out of the gate. To that, I'm also wondering, with a lot of the roles that you've had, they're, you know, they're the head of a something, the chief, the director. I was wondering about when coming into a new position for a new company, not staying, let's say, in Cargill or something. How, how did you approach this new change in terms of the role? Did you prepare when you came into a new role? Like, how were the first few weeks... I think very good question, Ranika. And, and for our fresh graduates, uh, I think this may be uh, a, a, a light for them to, to, to look into. First of all, I don't let my student die inside me. So basically, you need to keep your egos down. You need to keep your tool bag that you are carrying on the side when you join the new company or new place. You have to take a scan of that company as a learner first. So the model that I always adapt is learn and lead. And they go, they overlap each other in the first, uh, in the first few months of when you join a new company. And no matter at, at which level you are. I mean, in, in my levels for the past almost 15 years, it has been a corporate level, a global, uh, or at least a regional head position in which basically you need to look at from a satellite view you need to scan the company. You need to look at their existing quality management system, their food safety systems, their technical affairs systems, and learn them first. Understand that why this company exists, what are their different product profiles, what are the risks, and what are the opportunities. And keep them to you. Don't just go and make start making decisions and making changes in the early times because you will make mistakes. If a company was existing before you join, it will always be existing. So you are not there to, you know, save the boat. You are there to bring them to the next level of excellence. And if you keep that mindset, then you will learn what they have. You will take some time to scan and review 
the gaps and opportunities. Then you sit down with the, with the key stakeholders and you go through two, three, four days, one week of strategy sessions and, and then drive a vision, a mission, a roadmap and a protocol to how would you identify those gaps and then you will go for the opportunities to, to, to fix them. But in that, very important to not be in a, in a hustle bustle type of situation, but be calm, be a person with the view to look at things and take them positively and learn through them. And don't be shy to even talk with the machinist. Don't be shy to be <laughs> sitting with the technician. Never be shy to be sitting with the general manager or even, even the president of the company to learn and ask the questions. If you keep your ego so high, then it will keep you away from learning and asking. So for me, taking time, learning the current situation of that company, picking up the gaps and opportunities along the way, and then coming back and sitting down with the stakeholders and building the strategic vision of that company makes a very good way to go. And then you can break down that journey of vision and mission making into KPIs and roadmap for that company for the next three to five years. And this is then you become the head of the orchestra and you keep those KPIs and vision and roadmap up on the top and then support your teams with your resources and with your collaboration with them and show your leadership that way. I love that. And it, 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 it shows that you're really keeping that student mindset, no matter if you're first day in the job and this is the start of your new career to you've been in the industry for 15 plus years and you're into a, a, a big role is initially sit back, learn as much, well, not sit back, but take, take in as much as you possibly can, ask all those questions, get the groundwork before you even start coming in with your own ideas, because you know, you need to understand the ground first. And like you said, if you don't, you're going to make some mistakes. So I think that's kind of reassuring to know that if you keep that kind of mindset as you continue in your career, that that's the way to go. And it doesn't always need to change in the, in, in terms of just learning first, learn, learn, learn. Right, right. Veronica. And this, I, I will, I will clarify one thing. Okay. Um, at, at a leadership position, you have two type of roles. One is strategic role and setting up the vision of the company. And this is what I was relating to when I said that take your time and understand before you start making big changes. Okay. 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 But, but there's another role in which you have to lead the process right away. You may oh, okay. make decisions the first day when you join the company, you know, mm -hmm. those days are for the running the show. For example, if you are in your office the very first day, and one plant is having a recall done, you can't, take, you can't say that I'm going to sit for next one month and try to understand the company. No, you should have experience and you should have the background to manage and guide that situation right away. That, that is different than strategic setup. Okay. okay. So day-to-day -day show should be a turnkey process for a, for a seasoned professional and they should not feel any different than any other, other, other company or the product. Because risk management is risk management, quality systems are quality systems, and food safety rules, norms are same, no matter where you go. Okay. I just wanted to clarify so that our, <laughs> our graduates don't feel like that. Um, there's, there, yes, there's difference <laughs> between strategic uh, al alignment and collaboration and setting up a roadmap for a company and running the day-to-day -day show. Okay. So you need to, you need to have a right balance. Okay. Right, in a Thank you for clarifying. See, this, this is where I fall in because I'm learning new things right now. And that was, I misunderstood. So this is great. So thank you. <laughs> We've talked about your career journey. And I think this is now a great time to actually talk about what you're doing now. Talk to me more about the current place that you're at. And I just want to know what the process of seaweed and how it gets to our plates and the food safety practices that are involved. Okay, Acadian Sea Plant is, I think, about 40, 45 years old company and started with a research and development type of project. It's a great example of a Canadian industrial success story from where something started from very small scale and then moved into a multinational company. 
they have a business in feed, animal feed, and then pet food ingredient side. They also have a, a business which is basically human uh, food uh, development and food, food manufacturing supply chain. Then they have agriculture products like plant stimulants and fruit stimulants and growth enhancers of fertilizer style products. And then there is another limb of the business, which is research and development centers and the McCready Research Center in Nova Scotia. My position as the global head of quality and senior uh, director of corporate quality systems is above all these three, four business units. But it all it all starts from, if you know the company's name, sea plants. So it's coming from all the aquaculture resources and, and marine resources. So what they do is that, for example, for their feed division, there is a species, very famous species uh, of seaweed, Escophyllum nodosum. So we harvest those from the from wild areas, which are selected very carefully, and they are the regulated areas. So the other business is the food side. This is where we have a very famous species called Contus crispus. So that is not harvested, wildly harvested from the marine, but that is using the marine water into offshore ponds. I mean, the size of football field uh, farms in which you have multiple farms and you grow the food-based seaweeds there. You start from hatcheries, basically, for, and then you take them to grow outs and you grow them, and then you harvest them, you process those, you pack them in a ready-to-eat situations. And the, mostly we market it, market it to the Asian countries, especially to Japan. And that is a very specific, very specialized type of commodity, ready-to-serve foods for the seafood. So it, it's a different seaweed species than the one which is used for feed side and uh, and uh, fertilizer side even. Okay. Now we go to the fertilizer side. This is where we take the seaweed and through very highly specialized biotechnology plants, I think the size of a sugar mill or, or a semen plant style, huge plants. This is where you extract the liquids, the desirable liquid extracts of the seaweeds and you use them into the into the soil enhancers, into the plant health enhancers and plant protection uh, products, agriculture products. And also you make powders of them when you can mix them in, in uh, other uh, agriculture inputs and soil inputs, and then you can add those powders into, into those agriculture products. Uh, our plant in India is basically then going further value added products from those powders and extracts there. And we have co-packers and joint ventures operations in, in South America and all over the world, which are, which are using the same concepts and, and producing products. So from production and manufacturing style, I just wanted to give you some nutshell of how the company is set up. I hope I answered your question, Veronica. Yeah, no, that was amazing. I, I, I find seaweed and this whole sea plants and that general aspect a really cool opportunity for Canada in terms of where it can go with um, so many places in the industry that we could we could take it and um, gosh I, I I'm at a loss for words because I was so into what you were saying that I forgot to ask the question yeah, I mean, even, even the feed that we make for animal we also have the food ingredient business with for, with the same species and uh, it is used into even vulnerable sector uh, actually what Veronica I mean what COVID has taught us um, more natural resources more lightly processed more less handle uh, products are going to be safer product for the people so seaweed coming from wild natural resources we don't add chemicals we don't add any preservatives we process the same seaweed with our technologies which are very specified to make them safer for even for vulnerable sector uh, people to to use even for animal and pet foods and also as ingredient into even drinks and beverages so those products can become value-added products for them the nutraceutical 
the pharmaceutical and the nutritional values of seaweeds are second to none. And in the COVID situation, especially, I mean, those pandemics where people are becoming so cautious about uh, having organic, having, uh, you know, natural resources to, to eat and consume, our business has grown. We, we can't even process enough to the demands of the, of the world. On the food side, we not only just process our Cordus crispus to make uh, directly consumable, food consumable products, but also beauty supplies. Um, I mean, for the oh skin and, and medicinal values, those products are enormous. And there's a huge business that our sales are always busy in selling all over the world. And like I said, we do not have enough supplies to even match mm -hmm. the demand. Yeah, and that's what I was thinking about too, because it's been on my radar for, we, we've, you know, being in chemistry, we've even talked about seaweed from the perspective of, of um, like energy production and those types of things. And I've known it's been aware for, you know, eating and all its different uses. So I just think it's a fascinating field. And I, I agree to what you had said is that we want to have the processes as simplified as possible because that it decreases the chance of something going wrong. If I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's just a fascinating thing. Did these types of companies, like what you're working at, do you still follow up things like HACCP plans, but wh where does food safety fall into this type of area? I guess it would be treated like agriculture? No, and yes. Actually, the thing is that um, the, the, when, when, it, when you talk about any feed ingredients or pet food ingredients, I mean, in the world of food safety right now, they are more stringent than even human food, okay? We are CFIA approved facilities. We are FDA approved. We are EU approved facilities. We are organic approved facilities. Our whole process are, are halal certified. We are SQF certified. We have HACCP. We have GMP guidelines and, and certification. We have ISO 22000. Okay. And uh, we have all kind of even food and feed certification, like FAMIS, which is the, the SQFI, which is GFSI based uh, uh, certification in Europe as well as part of our feed system. So we have about 16 global standards and certification programs that we are carrying. And they are all not only just for uh, from a feed perspective, but all we, we're treating our feed also as a vulnerable sector food, food products, and making sure that our pet food, our animal feed, and our food products are up to the par of any global standard that, that might be there. Okay. Wow. It's, I, I've heard about the, the animal feed as well. There is a lot of different food safety programs that are in place. I think, I think one, one layman approach to that is with one of my teachers, he told me that a human will tell you that if a food has made them sick, you know, it will be hard for animal to explain to you that which food has made them made them sick. So you need to be at your toes and make sure that all those areas which can make an animal health go wrong are managed upfront and without a complaint. So that is the major difference when it comes to that level. I was talking to some people in Mars, Mars company, which is making a huge impact in the pet food sector. And we were talking to some technical people and we came to know that food industry and animal feed industry is becoming really, really stringent, much more than in normal human product food safety. So we, we are always learning. We're always crossing our notes and we are always on our toes to make sure that our products are safe, even from organic perspective, from environmental perspective, from uh, their uh, ethnic background, for example, kosher and halal perspective. And beyond that, we are looking after the allergen situation. We're looking after arsenic, lead, mercury conditions, and we are looking after microbiological loads. And each and every facility has a positive release program on the food safety basis that all the microbiological and pathogenic testing has to be cleared and released before the product is gone out of our, our facilities. So we, we carry the product as even a dairy product or baby food, not, not nothing less than that. I love, that makes me, having that reassurance to hear that, that makes me very happy as a pet owner as well. I 
you said it, you know, your pet doesn't know how to tell you that, oh, I'm getting sick because like, I actually had a cat, for example, that was allergic to cat food, like traditional cat foods. And, you know, we're at home going like, I have no clue what's wrong. With, you know, you always think to other things, but we switched him to a hyperallergenic cat food and the problem was solved. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. definitely. And my, my background, my strong background from a food science background, I think I am in a, in a good position to help company to, to not be thinking as, or not be thinking as just an animal feed production, but to basically look at the food standards and making sure that those, those standards are met even for feed. Mm -hmm. and, and we are in a, in a great project right now in our Europe and even in, in Canada to have our feed plant also produce the food ingredients. So all the sanitation measures all the hygienic situations, all the clean in place uh, conditions, everything has to be met to a food standard anyway. So our plants can be used for feed or food at any given time. One of the things that I wanted to ask because of your position was as someone who's worked a little bit in the food industry, I can feel that sometimes that someone who's in a higher position, like a director, they can kind of become disconnected. You know, you never even see these people on the ground floor. How do you address this issue? And how do you make sure that things are being followed on the ground floor after all these protocols are being put in place? I think this is where the real leadership comes in, in into the picture and play. You need to understand that if you are making a policy or you have a program or SOP or a work instruction even to the, to the ground level, as a leader, you, you definitely set your goals for the company, for the overall global situation, but you also need to understand you should have a process of reaching of those policies and procedures to the core of your company where the people are working on the lines. And that, that happens with empowering your local staff at that, that plant or that local market even if, even at the country level and then going going to the going to the plant level for example all the qa leads which are qa managers or regional managers they report into my position they are in they are they are in a daily contact with me i will not say weekly but daily contact okay and to make sure that anything that we are developing at the corporate trickles down to them in a very user friendly way and we have our awareness sessions and we make sure that we discuss things very openly. We have a reporting structure, which has a tier one, two, three, tier one being the corporate reporting, then regional type of reporting, and then going to the plant and, and, and production lines reporting st structure. So that gives us communication to what's happening to our KPIs. But support, uh, it's very difficult for a person like me to sit in Canada, especially in the past year and a half in COVID, when we were not even allowed, we still not allowed to travel openly and to reach out to our teams uh, in, in the global scenario. And even within Canada and US, things became a bit hard to, to really make sure that they feel the leadership being with them at the facilities. But you know, this is the learning that we had, electronic system, our Vatex teams and our uh, Microsoft teams and Zoom has helped us to basically connect with the people even more frequent than we could just travel there at, in the past. So now at, there are times when we are meeting like twice a day and we are discussing face-to-face -face all the situation. We use the camera technology, we use mobile technology to go to any certain area of the plant. Operations are, have actually increased their productivity in during the COVID, like I said, our company has been very successful when it comes to natural products and organic products. So for me, to make sure that how the message of the corporate has reached that is simple. But like you said, physically presence on the lines is not always possible, even before and especially within the COVID situation. But your leadership style should be that you are in a, you, you increase your communication with your people, with your face at that facility and make sure that you connect with them regularly and you listen to them. To listen to them, their issues, and then sit down with them one to one or in teams and try to help them. I will give you a small example that for the past two days, Thursday and Friday, 
we had our first ever QMS ISO program being developed at one of our facilities in Cornwallis, Nova Scotia. And we were from all over different places of our different, uh, different plants and our corporate offices. Everybody was part of that exercise and everybody was part of that learning. So we had people, even technicians, and I was part of those two days. I sat down here person to person, answered their questions and, and created that synergy between us. So hard, I know your question is, is, is difficult to answer because <laughs> you not be at every place, mm -hmm. but you have to make sure that you have a very positive communication and empower your people with the resources and with authority when they're working on those facilities to support them. That gives me a better perspective as well. Seeing your leadership style, you see the, the ground level food safety people, let's just put it that way, but if you're in constant connection with the managers, the QA managers of each of the, each of the facilities, and that's, that's how you make sure that things are staying on top and to talk daily. Like that's, I don't know. I don't know why that surprises me so much. <laughs> The, the best thing is that you, you set up a, you know, you, you put yourself in a schedule. For example, if you have a week and then you say that twice a week, I'm going to have all my team for half an hour or two hours or one hour at, uh, at a video conference where we give our, you know, what's happening at the facility, what are the top line issues. I call them hot spots and uh, bright spots, or you can say shining spots. So we, we share the successes and we also share concern. And then no, no person, even with my experience of 25, 26 years, I never considered myself as to be expert of everything. So the best thing is to talk to those people. And most of the time, 90% of the time, the solution is sitting within them. You just have to identify and direct them to the right side. That's where you make the big bucks. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> True leadership at work. But I, I can imagine it takes time to be able to identify that that's the thing to bring out in the person. And you just, over time, you develop. And like you've said, you've had all these experiences for you around the world that you've you've been able to see different people and walks of life that you can bring it out in them. One of the other things, like to what I was just saying, that you've been around the world, I would assume that different places in the world have different kind of food safety cultures and ways that they approach it. I know that we have these global standards of like ISO and BRC and those types of things, but I was curious about other countries and the food cultures that are there in terms of food safety. Is there any from around the world that you would like Canada to adopt more or take some hints from? Yeah, being being a professional who you know who grew up uh, basically professionally, my growth was in U.S. and Canada. Um, I. I have learned one thing, and I, I will share it without any doubt, that part of Europe and mostly Canadian businesses and also U.S. businesses needs to start learning a few things from, I will say, Asian way of, of food safety and quality cultures. Although uh, in the Asian side, you know, the hierarchy system works when somebody from the top or somebody from your management has given a direction, then people simply just do it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they follow that to the core and they follow that to the perfections. And, and this is the nature of the people working there. Facilities, and especially even, even if there's a Canadian company or American company, you can go to their facilities here in Canada and US, and you will see a lot of gaps in I mean, mostly uh, industries are old industries. They have not set up with the new machineries and new infrastructure and things like that. And people do carry a different attitude of work here. But if you take the same facility, same companies, plants, and their, their uh, factories back, for example, in uh, Far East Asia or in Southeast Asia, you will feel that they are way further, way far uh, ahead in cleaning, in setting up the systems, in understanding the requirements, and then following up to the core, okay? okay? And they take a lot of pride into putting together the food safety system and culture for them. So what I, I have felt working on the both sides in Asian countryside, in Europe, and also in North America, I, I have, I, I would say that there's a lot that 
Canada and US definitely, and especially Canada, gives away from the technology perspective, from uh, capability development. But when it comes to the real implementation of those uh, areas, I think we should be learning from the facilities and, and, and people and professionals and places uh, of food manufacturing and food handling, which are in Asian countries, especially. Okay. And okay. perception, Veronica, mostly it is that in third world countries, the people are not caring about food safety a lot. I mean, that is, we're talking about streets. I'm talking about a structured yeah. food, food and beverage manufacturing industry. You will, if you ever visit, you will see that plants in Turkey, uh, the food plants in Saudi Arabia, the food plants in Middle East, food and beverage plants in Korea, in Japan, in India, even in Pakistan, much, much more cleaner and sophisticated and managed well, well ahead of any European or, or Canadian plant. So it's, uh, I, I think it's a learning on the both sides. Okay. See, and that's why I wanted to ask you this question, because as someone who's only been in Canadian facilities, I, I had a feeling that there was differences in, in the approaches to things and how things are viewed, but I just wanted to hear firsthand about someone who's seen them, how, how they are, because I, I think that's an interesting topic as well, just food safety around the world and just how different places implement. We could have the exact same product, but how two places are approaching it is different. And I think that we can learn from one another to ultimately create this better food safety system. So thank you. But, yeah. In this one, one thing I, I will add from a technical perspective. Okay. As the geography changes, as the geo-economical situation of every country and region are difficult, uh, different, the resources in North America are different than if you were talking about Guam or Philippines or Vietnam, or, you know, Malaysia. Yes. Um, and also the environment is different. So not every, it should not be a cookie cutting type of approach. I think a person who is looking at a global scenario and they are, they are looking at what type of food safety measures or quality assurance or quality control measures be put in different countries and different regions. It has to be in the light of what is really needed in that country from regulatory perspective, from customers acceptance and also customers demand. And at the same time, the environmental conditions of that country and the products which are being made. It's a mix that you have to, you know, have an equation solved for the region and for that local market. It's not easy that you take one SOP or one norm set of norms of food safety from North America and try to paint it uh, with a highly hot and tropical humid country in, uh, for example, in Africa or mm -hmm. in, uh, in Southeast Asia. So you, you will need that exposure to make sure that how you customize the rules and regulations, not, not rules and regulations, I mean, rules and regulations are, are, are card on the stone, but I'm talking about the implementation and how, the, how to approach those norms of food safety in, in different countries. It's very important that you have, a, you have gone through that experience of, of making sure that it's really set for that, that market and not just painting the wall everywhere with one brush. So be very open and to learn the area, product, its uh, environment, temperatures, uh, culture of the people, how they will manage that and what would you need to approach them, how to follow it right. See, this is what I'm learning so much from this conversation, this perspective that, again, as you say it, it makes sense. But on the surface, it I, I never thought about, yes, uh, different environments would dictate different types of approaches different things work for certain places that others you know we I don't live in a highly human climate so that's not going to be as much of a focus for certain places see you've had this experience that that you just can click it in in a podcast openly talking with me that you can already name off these things I, I had no choice but to learn it <laughs> and then you are working there and you are taking the the education and capability development tools from us and canada you need to be open to to the to customizing them according to the needs of that area and those products mm -hmm. so 
one of the things that I wanted to shift our conversation to is that, you know, we're, we're talking and we're putting this out for new graduates, students still in school, or even people considering careers in food safety. So because of your experience, I could imagine you have a very big perspective on the food industries, particularly in food safety. I would love for you to just openly talk about the big picture and how food safety, where it could take someone if they chose that as their career path? What kind of jobs are there out there? Being father of three daughters and um, and being around the world, one thing that I always put it simply that any living living thing, which soon after their creation, look for one thing is food. <laughs> so so food graduates should, should not be worried about their, their future. Food is going to be always here. From a career perspective, if somebody has chosen food safety, food quality assurance, food manufacturing, food science, food science, food technology, food processing, then I really congratulate them that they are in the, in the right business to serve the humanity and to serve all the living things around them. Okay, and mm -hmm. living living organisms around them. So what I will say from a from a food safety perspective for the for the young uh, professionals and people who they are just graduating or they have just recently graduated, I will first of all ask them to be open, be flexible, very flexible. And don't think that the very first day they will enter into the field, it takes time. It takes time to learn. It takes time to understand the scenario where they are. So they need to make sure that whatever they have studied, they will have to put it into a practical situation. I give you an example that when I was doing my BSc honors in food science and technology, the concentration of single strength juices and to make them to a 65 bricks juice or 60 bricks juice uh, concentrate was maybe one chapter, half a chapter. Mm -hmm. But when I started working for Cargill, I was standing at 400 acres facility with 40 lines of orange juice being made. Oh my gosh. 40 lines of byproducts and about uh, 600 people coming out of it in one shift. For three shifts, you can tell that 2,000 people would be walking around. Yeah, that is insane. So, so how, how to basically then you juggle those half, I mean, one chapter of concentration in, in the food and beverage sector that you have studied in, 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 your, in, your, in, your, in your career, uh, educational career, but how you then start implementing that and learning that into the actual field. Um, this is where the rubber hits the road. So your attitude should be, you keep that same, I will again say when you have graduated from your master's, from your bachelor of food, science, uh, food technology, when you come to the field, keep that student alive in you. The very first day that you are at the facility, don't think that you are you are started earning what you are, what you are worth, you will be worth much more than what you will be earning in the start. I, I, can, I can bet you that. God willing, you will have that. The only thing is that you have to prove it constantly, consistently, regularly, and step by step. Okay? And learn through it. Master it to what you have been given the work. For example, you have been given the work to run HPLC or a mass spec or do fat analysis or moisture analysis or any ingredient analysis in your lab master those. Do not just follow the results to say that, okay, this is the result and then just given to your politician, supervisor or manager or your director. You should give results with your opinion attached to it. You should look at the results as a talking data and not dead numbers in front of you. Even if you're working at a very low, at, at a very entry level as, as a QA technician somewhere, you must make sure that you should know that why this test is being done, what is the impact of this product that I'm, uh, impact on the final product or internal product that I'm testing for, how this test will, you know, impact the bottom line, the financial line of this company, and how it will help to develop the next stage of this processing. If you know that, and if you know that background, then only your numbers will start making sense to you. And before you will give those results to your superiors, you will also put two or three alternatives beside that to say that if this product has gone out of spec, I think we can do this, this, and that. 
And this is where your right leadership and your management style will start shining up and coming out. So not don't, don't constrict yourself into one field. The first five years of your after your graduation are your core learning and, and your attitude setup time. You know, if, if you are if you are in one job for two, three years within the same company, even you can switch to something else and do something different and prove yourself in those two, three, two to three years. So first five to six years, I will say, don't be worried about pays and positions and roles. Worry about your learning and worry about how you show your value as a professional. And you will see that roles and the positions and money will follow you sooner or later. That, that I can trust. So I want to just really understand what you're saying, but I feel like when you're early on in your career, you, you don't actually know why it's wrong. So I, even for example, to talk about my research that I do at school, cause it, I'm thinking about that. I look at a result. I don't actually really understand what I'm seeing. I knew that this test was useful. How do you learn to get to the point where you can even interpret the results? Do you actively, cause it sounds as though you're kind of skipping a step and in learning and then saying to your supervisor, this is the this is what I think about it, but how do you get to that step that you actually understand what you're looking at? Hopefully that question was understood properly. <laughs> yeah. Look, Ranik, I mean, when you are in the, in the actual world and you are in a working scenario, you really don't have time to go back to the university and start a research again. Okay. Mm -hmm. The best thing is that you learn from your peers and your next level seniors at that facility, at that operation where you are. For example, that if you are testing a product and you have been told that, okay, you stand there, there are the samples and you just keep checking the uh, sodium benzoate levels in this, in this juice, okay, mm -hmm. or the preservative level in this juice. So you ask them that this product that we are making, uh, why does it need to have a preservative? Okay, so that will open up the uh, risks in that, in that, in that product. And then you, are, you will know that why we are using this much concentration. And if that concentration will be ever lower, you will know that this is because that we are saving our shelf life. We are saving the quality, we're saying the food safety of this product, and we are, we are saving the spoilage of this risk and that level. But that you will need to learn at job as you ask your questions, okay? okay. So, there are people you will see in different labs standing, uh, uh, you know, food scientists standing there and then just generating a data. And with the time now, they will become obsolete because data may be generated by machines anymore, you know, mm -hmm. and people, people interaction will be lower and lower. So where the value would come, the value would come that if we know that what is the impact of that data and if we know the alternatives, but this will not come by going back to the universities or colleges, that will come by learning on job and asking the right questions to, to the people around you. And you know, the, the best thing which worked for me is to look for a person who is uh, less used and less asked. So oh. go to a senior who's there, but people are not approaching that person. So, so find your time to spend some time with them and ask them that I'm asking not to test you, but just, just for learning. And how you will approach the people in the industry, that will make a lot of difference, Veronica. Because if you approach them with a non-threatening way, with respect, and with a student mindset and attitude, then they will be helping you. And you know what? Today, what I, whatever I am today, that is also because of those people who they held my hand in those times 20 years ago, when I was in that stage where some of our food bags would be. So don't worry about that. You will learn at the facility, but you should have the attitude to explore the picture behind those numbers. And you will see with the time you will start having your own toolbox to understand things. I love that. Even that little part by saying, starting the conversation with, I'm not asking to test you. I'm asking to learn because yeah. for some people on the floor, if you are coming in as this QA supervisor or QA tech and, and, you know, you're asking questions, people could feel, feel like it's kind of threatening because all of a sudden you're nailing all these questions, but coming from that, like starting the conversation from that perspective of I'm learning, 
I don't really understand this. That can totally change someone's view and they will be more open to teaching you because then they kind of get put in the position that they're the expert and that kind of feels good for them. <laughs> so and, 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 and it, doesn't, it doesn't have to be a manager or, a, or an engineer to answer your question. Mm -hmm. You can really go to, to any technician, you can go to any operator of the machine and say that I am testing this part uh, of your interim product. I just need to understand what do you think is the risk? Why, why they're asking me to test this, you know? Mm -hmm. So you will, you will know some answers which will not be in the books, but that will, that will be your asset going through. I wanted to add one thing. Do not limit your scope by yourself. You have the background being the food grads. You have the background to work into any scenario of food manufacturing or even beyond that. Okay. So if it is quality control, if it is quality assurance, if it is total quality management, if it is food safety side, if it is regulatory affairs, if it is technical services, if it is operational side, production side, supply chain side, um, governmental public areas, you just name it. You can work anywhere. You just have to be open and to make sure that no matter where you go, your degree in food science and technology or your food graduation would help you. So don't, do not just say that I am a, I am, I'm going to be a quality person or I'm going to be an operational person bus or only, or I'm going to be just a food safety expert. Yes, you may be a food safety expert, but you may then limit your scope to be a overall uh, leader for the food science and technology one day. If you want to be next 15, 20 years later, um, you want to lead a company overall, then the company will look at a person who has a broader scope of experience and can help them go forward from different perspectives, not only just one field within the food education system. Okay. Thank you. If I can even add on to that as well, is that from what I've learned doing this podcast from working and, and even it's being echoed from the people that I talk to that, that we aren't limited. Like, it's so great that we're, that you're choosing, if you go into the food industry, that there's so many avenues that you can kick, kick your career at, and you're not limited. And, and the only thing that's really holding your back is yourself. You can have a, if this, this career can take you around the world, like look at you as a prime example that you just have to say, I want to do this and just follow the path and you can take it anywhere. Yeah. So keep, keep the learning and leading model in your mind that you want to learn and you want to lead and uh, have a good balance of, uh, of your strategic side and your operational control side. And I, I have no doubt that you, will, you won't be successful. You will be successful. And if you, if you want to connect with me, I am at LinkedIn. You can just type Nasir Hamid. My profile will just come up right away. I love it. So once again, thank you, Nasir, for coming on the show. This was a great, I, the time flew by. I got so much in, out of this and I really hope that our audience did too. That was episode 32 of the Food Grads podcast. All the notes to this podcast can be found on the Food Grads website by clicking the podcast tab on the homepage. There, you can find any notes to past or future episodes. If you like this podcast but wanted to get your questions asked live, then make sure you check out our partnership with Careers Now and their interactive mentorship sessions where guest speakers who currently work in the industry will describe their career journeys, motivations, and aspirations in the food and beverage industry. From when this episode is being released till February 15th, 2022, Careers Now will have guests from all across the industry with potential of more to come. So if you want to check that out, then check out the link for the show notes in this episode. Anyways, that's it for this week's episode. Thank you everyone so much for listening and I will see you next time.